right, let's go to that Old Testament and go to the last book there, Malachi. Malachi. Now, we're still going to be in the Old Testament for a little while on our journey through the Scriptures, and that is because we have not yet touched on a very unique section of the Old Testament, and that is the poetic section. And uh, that's kind of a mixture. There were different authors at different times writing those things. And so we've left that kind of as the last thing we're going to look at. But Malachi is the last chronological book of the Old Testament. And so we come to it. Malachi, and we'll be in chapter 1, and we'll look at some other scriptures from Malachi in a moment. Now, you remember our headings. When we're in the prophet section, we're looking at different prophets and their uh, we're looking at them as individuals, so we're looking at the man, and then we're looking at the message. What was the message that they came with? And then we're giving you some miscellaneous information that will encourage you and challenge you. And so that's our heading tonight. So first of all, the man, Malachi. He is, as already noted, the last voice of the Old Testament. After, after Malachi closes out, we come to the, the uh, uh, section of time uh, where we're in between two testaments. The Old Testament is completed. The New Testament is yet to begin. And you have 400 years there. You turn the page over uh, from Malachi, and you go right into Matthew. And you don't think about it. I don't think about it. But there's 400 years represented during that time. Think about that for a moment. In the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, what happens? Well... The Medes and the Persians are overtaken by the Greeks. And the Greeks rise up and introduce through their empire an immense time of learning. And that's why the New Testament was predominantly written in Greek. But they were not in charge when Jesus comes on the scene in Matthew. No, they are already passed off the scene. They fall to the Romans. And the Romans produce a worldwide government. The Romans were all the way up in, the, in Europe, and they were all the way down in the Middle East and in, into parts of northern Africa. They were all over the place. And they produced a one-world system, so to speak. Uh, one emperor, one currency, one military. And uh, so when you turn from Malachi to Matthew, when you do that in your own personal study... I encourage you to stop and say, I've just gone through 400 years of history <laughs> by turning one page. Malachi is a very interesting book because it's the last book of the Old Testament, the last book of uh, this great piece of divine literature, the Old Testament. After him, the next voice that is going to be heard is the voice of John the Baptist. And it's interesting because Malachi tells us about the coming of John the Baptist. 400 years before John came, he spoke about that witness who was going to come and prepare the way of the Lord. So Malachi is an interesting book because of its placement within the canon of Scripture. His name means my messenger, or in other words, the messenger of the Lord. He ministered either during the time of Nehemiah or directly after the time of Nehemiah. And it is most likely that he would have known Haggai and Zechariah and these other prophets that we had mentioned uh, before. Other than those things that we've just told you, nothing else is really known on a personal level about Malachi. You're in chapter 1. Notice verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, verse 2, I have loved you, saith the Lord. It's interesting to note that when we talked about the other prophets, at least the majority of them would say, uh, I am the son of this person, the son of this person. And they would give us, even if it was just a limited amount of information about themselves, they would give us some information about themselves. Malachi doesn't do that. Malachi says... This is the Lord's message. You know what his philosophy must have been? It's the same philosophy you and I need today. Speak the truth and get out of the way. Speak the message that God has given you to speak 
and remove yourself from the equation, that must have been Malachi's philosophy, and that's a good philosophy. Because when we speak God's word, God can take that word, and he does take that word, and he empowers it, and he touches hearts with his word. But when we get in the way, and when we try to think of the right thing to say, and when we get too involved, what happens? We detract with our flaws, with our inconsistencies. We detract from the glorious and powerful message of God. We need to speak the truth and allow the truth to do its holy work. I cannot convince anyone, and you cannot convince anyone. We are powerless to convince. Now, we can persuade, uh, but there's a fine line between persuading someone and convincing someone. If I want to persuade my children that, you know, broccoli tastes good, I can put cheese on it, and I can... I can make all delicious noises as I'm eating it. Oh, mm, oh, this is the best thing I've ever eaten. And they might be persuaded to step out in faith, so to speak, and give it a try. But they will not be convinced once they put that heathen weed into their mouth, <laughs> which is only good in what my wife calls a broccoli brownie. It, it's not brownie at all, but it's full of cheese and all types of things, and she bakes it in the oven, and it's delicious. But other than that, it's a heathen weed that should be preached against and, re and, and repented of. No. But you catch what I'm saying. They won't be convinced unless their taste buds happen to like that thing. The Holy Spirit can take something hard and convict a sinner and convince that sinner of his ways and where his ways are going to lead him and bring him to a place where he sees his need and by faith reaches out and claims Jesus as Savior. He can take a hard-hearted Christian who is backslidden and, and living in sin and living uh, in the flesh and the Holy Spirit can take his word and he can convince that Christian of his need to live right and to be right and to change his ways. And by the Holy Spirit's power, we can change our ways. But you and I going around, talking down to people and persuading people, we have to be careful. We have to be careful that we speak God's word and we give God's message and then we get out of the way and let God, through his word, do his work. And that's the philosophy that Malachi had. He goes right into the message. And what was the message of Malachi? In verse 2 there, uh, this is the Lord speaking, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Now Malachi, we're going to see in a moment, challenges the people of Israel with their sin. But he begins that message, and he does give them a very hard message. We're going to look at it in a moment. I mean, he really lays some sin against them. But he begins with this, the Lord loves you. The Lord loves you. No matter how dark our sin is, no matter how bad it is, oh, don't get me wrong, God can't overlook it because he is a thrice holy God. Righteousness, what did we say on Sunday morning? Demands righteousness. And so that's why he says, I am holy, you be holy. I am ethical, you be ethical. I am moral, you be moral because righteousness demands righteousness. God's not going to overlook our sin. God's not going to say our sin is okay. But God, no matter how dark our sin might be, He loves us. He loves us. And don't you ever forget it. You are loved by God. You are loved by God. Now, let's look at His message here. That's all we really know about Malachi the man, but we know quite a bit about His message here. Some have called the book of Malachi a one-book summary of the Old Testament. Now, that's fitting. We've come to the end of the Old Testament. It's almost like God gives us a reminder, gives us a synopsis, a summary. This is what we've just gone through. <laughs> For example, in, verse, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, we see the selection of Israel. 
I have loved you, he says in verse 2. In verse 3, he says, I hated Esau. Or in other words, I have rejected Esau. I have accepted Jacob. I have, I have refused Esau. So we see Israel selected in those verses. In chapters, uh, chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, we see Israel's transgression. What did we see continually through our journey so far in the Old Testament? We've seen God pouring out his love on Israel, Israel having times of revival, but then slipping back into backslidden conditions where they have chosen gods, false gods that are all around them. And uh, in chapter 2, verse 11 through 13, that's what Malachi says. He says uh, in verse 11 of chapter 2, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of, of a strange God. So we see Israel selected. We see Israel's transgression. We see also in Malachi the prophecies concerning the coming Messiah. Look at chapter 3. Again, a huge part of the Old Testament is not only the history of God choosing Israel and Israel's back and forth between God and false gods, true God, true God and false gods, but we also are uh, continually faced with this truth. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. Be ready for the coming Messiah. Malachi touches on the coming Messiah. Chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. Now that's a reference to John the Baptist. And the Lord whom ye seek, that's the Messiah, that's Jesus, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant or of salvation, whom ye dwelt in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So we are reminded that the Lord is coming here in Malachi chapter 3. And, of course, we look back in this church age and we say, praise God, he has come. Now, also, uh, we are constantly confronted with the truth that Jesus is coming again in the Old Testament. The day of the Lord. What is that day? That was not his first coming. The day of the Lord is his second coming where he comes to rule and to reign and to judge in righteousness. And verse, in chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, those are all those who have re uh, rejected Jesus as Lord and Savior, all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Peter says in his writings, uh, you know that the, the elements of this world are going to be burned up, the day of the Lord is going to be a day of holy vengeance, holy judgment, and holy wrath. And so the book of Malachi really is a summary of all that we've already heard in the Old Testament. The key things, the history of Israel being selected by God, their refusal to uh, follow him and their, and their backslidden condition, yet he still loves them. We saw that over and over and over again. The prophecies concerning the coming Messiah and the warning concerning the coming day of the Lord. Now the theme of the book is God's messenger, and that's a very fitting uh, theme. The word messenger is found several times within the book in reference not only to Malachi himself, but to John the Baptist and Jesus and to even others. So, the theme of the book is God's messenger. Now, it's interesting to note that God has always used messengers. Uh, he uses the physical world around us to be a type of a messenger. It declares, the Bible says. The heavens declare. What, what does that mean? They're testifying. They're a messenger of God's power. Jesus said, if we fail to worship him, the rocks will cry out. They would be a messenger for him if we refuse to be the messengers we're supposed to be. God called the prophets and the priests to be messengers, and the kings of Israel to be messengers uh, of his. And in the New Testament age, in this church age that we live in, it's just the same. 
God calls men and women to be his messenger, to be his messenger of salvation, to be his messengers of grace, to be his messengers, to preach from pulpits, and to preach in the workplace, and to preach on the street corners. And what are we to be a messenger of? Morals? Political views? No, we leave that to God to change hearts and minds. We are, we are supposed to say, man is sinful, but God has rede will redeem you if you will come to him in faith through Jesus Christ. That's the message of the gospel. The good news that though man has rebelled against his creator, his creator supremely still loves him and has sent a savior to save him. Now, Christ is seen in a very unique way in this book. Go over to chapter 4, if you would. And he is referenced here as the Son, S-U-N, not S-O-N, but the Son of Righteousness. This is a picture or an allusion to his brightness and his beauty and his authority and his power. Chapter 4, verse 2. But unto you that fear, my name shall, uh, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Now that, that's a part of a Christmas song we sing. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. The son of righteousness. This is only used in this exact phraseology here in Malachi. But go over to Revelation 22. So we're going from the last book of the Old Testament to the last book of the New Testament. And we're going to the last chapter of the New Testament. And look at verse 16, because there's something interesting here. There's a correlation here. He's called the son of righteousness in Malachi chapter 4, the last chapter of the Old Testament. He's called the bright morning star here in Revelation 22, the last chapter of the New Testament, and verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel. Now let's stop there for a moment. What is the theme of Malachi? My messenger. We're messengers. Do you know that in some languages the word messenger is translated as angels? Why is that? Because that's what an angel is. An angel is a created being. Created to do what? God's bidding. He's supposed to be a messenger of God. And uh, so look at what he says there. I have sent mine angel to testify unto you, that's the work of a messenger, these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now, What's the point of this? What's the point of pointing this out other than just it being interesting that the Old Testament ends with a, a picture of Jesus, the son of righteousness, and in the New Testament, Jesus, that bright, and morning, that bright morning star. What's, what's, the, what's the idea here? Well, here's the idea. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament ends challenging us to do what? To look up. Look up to the son of righteousness. Be ready for his coming. Just as if you were to wake up early in the morning in winter time, you're ready to go to work, and in the old days that you didn't have lights, you just had your candle, and you would be anticipating that sunrise. You were looking for that son of righteousness. The Old Testament ends with that challenge. Look for the coming of the Messiah. He's going to come just like the rising of the sun. The son of righteousness. We're to look up as Christians. And the, old, the New Testament ends with the same challenge. That bright morning star. You know, they tell us that the darkest part of night is just before the sunrise. Just before that bright morning star appears in the sky. You know, the days are dark. And it's easy to shut our eyes and clench our fists and hide in the corner of life and say, Oh, I'm just going to wait it out. But Jesus says, don't do that. Here's my message to you. Look up. Look up. The Jews were about to enter into a very 
trying, difficult 400 years. Can I remind you what they just came out of? They just came out of Babylonian exile. For hundreds of years, they were, in cap they were captured by Babylon and Persia. So much so that two or three generations grew up not even knowing what Israel looked like. They had no love for Jerusalem. That is seen in the fact that when they came back there, it took them a lot longer than it should have to rebuild the walls and the temple. And the prophets had to come and chastise them because they were living in homes that were sealed. And yet the reason they came back to Jerusalem, they weren't working on the walls and the temple. They're back in Israel at this time of Malachi, but they're not going to be free for long. Those Greeks are coming. Those Romans are coming. And we fast forward to Jesus' day and we see how the Romans were mishandling and mistreating Israel. And yet they were challenged. Look up. Look up. Be ready. Be watching. Have your lamps all trimmed and filled with oil. Be ready for that son of righteousness to come up over that horizon. And the New Testament ends with, be ready for that bright and morning star. The poet wrote, somewhere beyond the stars is a love that is better than fate. And when night unlocks her iron bars, I shall see him. And so I watch and wait. Malachi leaves us with that idea. Be ready. Be watching. Be waiting. Paul gives the church at Thessalonica the same commands. Be ready. Be watching. Be ready. Be watching. Now, let me give you some miscellaneous information. The content of this book is a mixture of both prophetic and practical. We have already noted that he gives us the uh, prophecies concerning the coming of the forerunner to Christ, John the Baptist, and Christ's coming himself. But let's break down this chapter and let's divide it up and see what else we can learn from it. Chapters, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, we see the fact of God's love for Israel reestablished. We read those verses a moment ago. Let's look at verse 2 again. I have loved you, saith the Lord. I have chosen you, he says in verse 3 and in verse 4. Uh, in verse 5 he says, And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. The Lord loves Israel, and he chose Israel. And so he reestablishes that fact in chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Now, basically, the rest of chapter 1, all of chapter 2, and the majority of chapter 3, Malachi is pointing out the sin of Israel. So the message is this, I love you, your God loves you, but you have strayed from him, and you, I, the Lord can't overlook these things. And so he begins to go through the different things that Israel was guilty of during this time. Let's notice some of these things. Look at verse 6 of chapter 1. The son honoreth his father, a son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, now this is God speaking, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name? And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? The first sin, Malachi, being led by the Holy Spirit, of course, lays charge on Israel is this. They had an outright contempt for God. They had lost their respect for God. And now, in their eyes, God was somebody who was contemptible. He was not somebody to love and to fear and to respect. He was somebody to reject and to despise. God says, a father gets respect. An employer gets respect. But, but I get no respect. I am your heavenly father. I am your master. And yet, there's no fear of me. There's no respect of me. Look at verses 13 and 14. Ye said also, behold, what a weariness it is. And ye snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And ye brought that which was torn and lame and the sick, thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? 
Their contempt for God brings them to a place where they are performing their sacrifices very rigorously, very religiously. They're, they're there at the temple sl slaying the lambs and, and the goats and all of that and, and, and pouring the blood on the altar and giving the burnt offering. But he says, you're bringing me the lame. You're not supposed to bring me the sick sheep. You're supposed to bring me the best sheep you have. And yet you're bringing me the lame and the sick and the defiled ones. Look at verse 14. But cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male and voweth and sacrificeth unto the Lord to corrupt a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. God says to them, you know, even the heathen know who I am. Even the unsaved have respect for me in their hour of need. And yet you, my people, you bring me corrupt offerings because you have only contempt for me and no respect and no love. What an ancient writing Malachi is. And yet what a very modern sin this is. Today we have people who show contempt for God. And what a sad thing. Notice in chapter 2, not only was there outright contempt for God, but Malachi also says that, they, that the uh, priests were very corrupt. There was a corruption of the priesthood. The religious leaders were not speaking the word of God. They were feeding their own bellies and they were living for themselves and they were exalting themselves instead of doing their job, which is to exalt God. Chapter 2, verse 7. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have cursed many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. The priests were corrupted. That was the second thing that Malachi points out. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. He begins to deal now with the corruption of the home and the catastrophe of the broken home. And look at verse 11 there. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judea hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. So he says, first of all, in the home, you've caused catastrophe to come about because you have married uh, and you have yoked yourself to people that are, and you're now unequally yoked. He says, you've married people who follow false gods. Christians should only marry Christians. People have asked me, oh, Pastor Rich, you know, this girl over here, she got pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, isn't it right for them to, to automatically get married? Now listen, this is my philosophy. I don't have a chapter and verse on this specific thing, but I do have a chapter and verse that says, do not be unequally yoked. And I would never tell a young man and woman who get pregnant out of wedlock that the immediate thing they should do is get married. Because what if one of them isn't saved? What if one of them is not a believer? I don't want to be responsible for marrying two people because they made a foolish mistake that's going to be affecting them for the rest of their life. But now they're unequally yoked together? That's not going to help them. There needs to be, there needs to be salvation. There needs to be uh, a coming to the Lord. Now again, if you disagree with that, that's okay. You can go and marry anybody you want to marry, okay? <laughs> but that's, that's on you. But I do not want to take a young man who's saved and marry him to a young lady who's unsaved. I don't want to take a young lady who's saved and marry her to a young man who is lost. Two wrongs don't make a right. He says, you've married people that are lost. And your homes are devastated because of it. Then look at verse 14 and 15. Yet ye say, wherefore? Because the Lord hath witnessed between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one 
Yet uh, had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously, treacherously against the wife of his youth. Look at verse 16. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherous, treacherously. He deals here, Malachi does, uh, with the idea of divorce. Now, I want you to see very clearly that he uses the word treacherously. He does it a few times. He says it in verse 14. He describes it <coughs> in verse 15 and at the end of verse 15 mentions that word again. And then in verse 16 he says the word again. Now what does treacherously mean? has the idea of to act violently against one, to betray in a very criminal type way. Sometimes divorce needs to happen. If there's violence in the home, if there's um, just an, an immense amount of adultery and, or uh, fornication or whatever the case might be, if there's a, a, some type of a deep betrayal that just cannot be resolved there are certain times when divorce is the appropriate thing so that pain or suffering or danger is eliminated. But what Malachi is describing here is not that case. When he uses that word treacherously, he's talking about men who are now middle-aged. They don't like the wife of their youth anymore. She's got wrinkles where she didn't have wrinkles before. She's got some flab where she didn't have flab anymore. She's got some gray hairs where she doesn't have gray hairs anymore. And they're just not satisfied with that anymore. And instead of loving their spouse, they deal treacherously against her. They abandon her. They put her out, not because of any wrongdoing of her own, not because there's violence, not because there's uh, fornication, not because there's adultery, but just simply because they don't want to be married anymore to that person. Now listen, that's wrong. That's wrong. And uh, again, every case is different. Every situation is unique. And uh, we're not judging anyone here. What, what we are saying is there are instances where divorce is needed for the safety of all involved. But there is a time when divorce is just used to get out of something that you're sick of. And in those instances, I think the better thing to do is try to work out, for Christians at least, to work out the problem, if at all possible. Seek peace and pursue it, the Bible says. And I think that would be a fitting time to apply it. He also speaks uh, about the, uh, the love for wickedness. Look there in verse 17. You're still in Malachi chapter 2. Look at verse 17. He says, You're also guilty because you have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he, dealeth, uh, and he delighteth in them. Or, Where is the God of judgment? So we're talking about what Malachi is saying about Israel. He says, Listen, you, you have accepted wickedness. And in fact, you've not only accepted it, You've exalted it and said, this wicked thing that God has said is very wicked is actually good. Times have changed. Come on, loosen up. You know, it's, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. We can be free. And God says, no, I'm not pleased with that. God, I'm not pleased with that. When society, when Christian society begins giving credence and acceptance to wickedness and viewing wickedness as something that God can bless and that God accepts. The result of that is a complete rejection of God's authority. And that's what he says there in verse 17 in the last part of it. He says, you say, where is God? Where is the God of judgment? You've disregarded the authority of God. Why? Because you have, you have taken what God has said is wicked and you have 
in your mind and in your philosophy, you've turned it into something that is good and that God can even bless. And then in chapter 3, he speaks about a, the, the crime of stealing from God. Chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Question mark. Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Now let's define those two words. A tithe is a tenth. It was basically what God established as the amount that God's people in the Old Testament should give as a bare minimum. And then an offering is above and beyond the tithe. So it's like paying your taxes. The government says you must pay this much. But then you give to a charity or you give to church. And that's above and beyond your taxes. That's the tithe and the offering. The tithe is required. The offering is the free will. Whatever God has put on your heart to give above and beyond. Now some have said that in the New Testament we shouldn't use the tithes and offerings. I use the term tithe and offering. And I, for my own financial uh, finances, I give a tithe and an offering. Um, I do believe in the New Testament that uh, we're not confined by rigid rules. But that does not mean that we should give less. <laughs> it actually means we should give more. Because we, who are Gentiles especially, have received so much more from God. So, the people of Israel were guilty of grand larceny, so to speak, because they refused to give God what he required of them. He was, they were stealing from him. Now, I can't tell you how much God wants you to give financially. And I'm not, I, I, in all the years I've been a pastor, I never have done that. And I won't do that now. I'm not going to say you should give a certain amount. But what I am going to say is this. In my mind, I don't think you can go wrong giving a tenth. And, uh, but don't think that, well, I'll give my tenth. That's all God is. No, sometimes he's going to put it on your heart to give more. Uh, or give in a different way. And we have to be flexible and we've got the Holy Spirit in us. We have to yield to the Holy Spirit. And we have to trust him as he guides us in our giving. And I would say that if the Lord put something on your heart to give and you refused whether it be 10% or whether it had been 1% or whatever the case be, whatever the amount be, I would say that is stealing from God. I would say that was stealing from God. Because if God puts it on your heart, he's going to provide it for you to give, and he's going to bless you when you give it. And uh, he wants you to give it because he put it on your heart to give it. Let's move on there. He gives another sin here that they were guilty of, and that was one that we often are guilty of, and that is complaining. Complaining. Chapter 3, verse 13 your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Verse 14. Ye have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that ye have kept his ordinance and that ye have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? What are they guilty of? They're guilty of complaining about God. I have followed God. I've... I've, I've given to God. I've obeyed God's ordinances. And it's all in vain. He hasn't blessed me. He hasn't done the things that I would want him to do. Uh, he hasn't performed miracles in my life that I expected him to perform. It's all been in vain to follow God. And they started complaining against God and, and doubting his goodness and doubting his authority and doubting his favor. Ye have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that ye have kept his ordinance? What good is it to follow your God? He doesn't do anything for you. He doesn't do anything for us. They were complaining against God. Listen, we have no reason to complain against God. Now, I'm not saying that it's not something. It's common to all of us, this thing of complaining. In my life, in your life, complaining is a part of our fallen nature that... We have got to get under the control of the Holy Spirit. But especially when it comes to God. When you really think about it, what would we ever have to complain about God? 
even if all he ever did for us was save us, if that was the only thing he did for us, and then he left us alone for the rest of our lives, and then we died and we were ushered into heaven because of, of salvation, if that's the only thing he did for us, we have all, we, ha we should be praising him for all of eternity. A, a, a sour word ought never come out of our mouth towards him. Because in that simple thing of salvation, he did the greatest act, he performed the greatest act of love for us that we could have ever experienced. So we have no reason to ever, ever complain against God. And yet God's people have complained against him and, and we are guilty of that till, uh, still today. So the book of Malachi, he is a faithful messenger of the Lord. He's the last voice of the Old Testament. And with the closing of this book is the closing of the Old Testament and the ushering in of 400 years of silence. Now think of that. Generation after generation have heard the voice of God through the prophets. They heard his voice before the Babylonian exile. They heard his voice during the exile. They heard his voice after the exile. And now comes 400 years where all they can do is hold on to the precious promises. The coming of the Messiah, that son of righteousness. And for 400 years, that's all they had. Now, put your, now we're in the same situation, aren't we? The New Testament was closed at the book of Revelation. And God said there in the last chapter there of Revelation, don't add, don't take away. The canon of Scripture is complete, it's closed. You don't need to add anything and you shouldn't take away anything. And we have, for all these thousands of years, just hung on. But not without hope and not in vain. Because just as they looked for the Son of Righteousness, we... Look for that bright morning star. And just as after those 400 years, Galatians 4 says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem that were them that were under the law, that we might become, uh, receive the adoption of sons, just as that took place, there's coming a day when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to peel back the sky and rapture up his church and a new age is going to be ushered in and then after a while he's going to come and his kingdom is going to be established forever and little boys and little girls aren't going to be naughty in those days any, any more let's pray together Lord we love you and we thank you we just have no reason to ever doubt you or complain about you, but Lord, we do. We have a flesh, just like those Israelites of old. We have a flesh, and uh, we oftentimes fail you, and oftentimes, just like a little child who's being naughty, we are naughty uh, to you sometimes, and we, we reject your love, and we reject your commands, and yet you love us with an unending, unchanging love. Your word says just like a mother pitieth her child or a father protects his family. Lord, you just love us and you protect us. You want the best for us. And so help us to love you. Help us not to be guilty of these sins that were laid out against Israel. Complaining, robbing you, uh, showing contempt towards you by rejecting your authority. Not loving our spouses and just uh, not loving our families the way we ought to. Lord, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts. We pray that through this simple Bible study that you would be exalted and that we would be challenged and encouraged. We love you and we praise you now.